Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our second info session of the week. Um, Rizzo Lab and Visual Narrative Info Session B, Tools and Process. Um, I am, my name is Pan. I'll be the host of the evening. I already talked about my class on Tuesday and it's full anyway, so you won't, you won't hear too much from me um, beyond. And hi, Lisa, again, Lisa Marie's here for our second night. Um, so I know some of you are here um, because you're interested in the Rizzo classes. Some of you are here because of our comedy classes and our classes focusing on story and graphic novels. Um, but I want to quickly um, just talk a little bit about the department that the Rizzo Lab is connected to, sort of our parents' department, um, the MFA Visual Narrative Program. It's a low residency uh, MFA program with that involves three on on site semesters to take place um, on campus in New York City in the summer um, and to um, uh, several uh, low residency remote semesters in fall and spring. Um, this program offers a fresh perspective and a bold alternative to traditional MFA programs. We do so by recognizing that a command of story is the most powerful and fundamental foundation an artist in any creative profession can possess. We approach this through multidisciplinary study, ranging from character development with a theater director to world building with a game designer, to the foundations of visual language with experts in children's books, branding, mapping, film, and photography. We welcome students from diverse backgrounds, including those without a standard art training. A bachelor's degree in any area is acceptable. The MFA Visual Narrative Program is low residency. During the three summer intensive semesters at SBA in the heart of New York City, students attend courses supported by a network of industry and market experts. Throughout the four semesters of online study during the fall and spring, students are able to work remotely and travel without having to uproot their professional careers and family or change their personal lifestyles. And normally, Joan McCabe, the assistant to the uh, the chair um, of the MFA Vision Narrative Program, would be here to talk about the program and then introduce me, um, but she is not. Uh, what I will do, if you're interested in the um, in the program, is I will add um, her email in the chat so you can find out more. And also checking out the website, MFABN, um, mfavisualnarrative.sva.edu is another great way to find out more. So um, without further ado, I guess I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Banayotis Terziz. I'm an artist, printer, and publisher. Uh, I've been, I work in a variety of mediums. Um, you know, I do, I do freelance commercial work. Um, I'm active in the gallery world. Uh, and I've been working with uh, Rizograph printing for about 14 years at this point. Um, I'm the co-founder of the SVA Rizzo Lab, which I started with the MFA Visual Narrative Chair, Nathan Fox, in 2015. So we're starting our ninth uh, year uh, as, a, as pretty much the only fully open to the public uh, Rizzo Graph-based um, educational institution uh, in New York City, let alone um, the world. So um, a little bit about the Rizzo Lab itself. Um, you know, of course, you know, we, since the pandemic, um, we switched from having in-person info sessions um, as we did three times a year for our first few years in existence where we sort of, you know, still had to lay the groundwork in terms of what a Rizzo is, what it does, how it works, um, you know, inviting people into our space um, so that they could see our be the beautiful view that we have on the 11th floor of the building that we're in, in Chelsea. Um, you can see all the way down the financial district, one direction, all the way to Jersey, another direction, um, and talk about our classes. So this is a chance every semester to do what we're doing now, um, except of course, you don't, won't get the benefit of walking away from this session with a uh, color chart that's also a sneaky uh, sort of reminder that we have these classes you can sign up for. That being said, um, moving online, at least for these events, and having to sort of shut down our physical space forced us to 
innovate and figure out how we could continue the spirit that of the Rizzo Lab of this space, um, of the momentum that had been built up after four years in existence. Um, and so we launched a series of online classes um, where we distilled what it is about preparing images for the Rizzo print process into um, a series of different online courses focusing on the print production and the design. Um, and you know, we've we've taken all of those, all of that work is I think has really honed the skills of all the instructors at the lab. Um, and you know, if you take a class, an in-person class at the Rizzo Lab. Um, you will benefit from, you know, us having sort of been thrown in the fire and figuring out how to be even more clear and succinct about how to um, design work for the Rezo print process. Um, and we'll, we'll probably bring back in-person events at some point uh, in the near future, uh, open house so people can kind of see our space. But these days, um, with the numbers of, of people, maybe not tonight exactly, tonight, you know, everybody, everybody would more or less be able to fit. Um, but the the kinds of uh, the numbers in terms of attendance that we get in these online info sessions uh, wouldn't be humanly possible to to fit in our in our space. Um, so there is a benefit to meeting kind of online. Um, so before you know we get into our Rezo classes and the presentations by our instructors, just a couple of words about the Rezo process. What it is what is it about Rezo printing um, in particular? Uh, this this very sort of um, unassuming media where you can see by the Rizo's present Rizo Inc's presentation, Rizo Kagaku Corporation of Japan, the way they present themselves on their website, um, you don't wouldn't have any indication or any hint if you didn't already know about Rizo printing and the kind of work that artists have have made using these machines. You wouldn't have any hint that that you could do any of the kind of stuff that we do at the lab. Um, and I think part of what it is about what makes these machines special is that while they look like like a slightly bloated copy machine. In actuality, the, the way they print borrows more from traditional printmaking and sort of directly fuses the convenience and the speed um, of a copy machine with the sort of the, um, the ability to layer colors and build up an image with layers of colors um, from traditional printmaking. So it, it's uh, that combined with the the speed and the efficiency and and the value the um, the affordability has directly led to the explosion of the sort of grassroots phenomenon of artists buying rizos secondhand used um, from you know small businesses or coffee shops or restaurants that were using them to just print menus um, or church programs um, you know another sort of example of Rizos in the wild, sort of the non-artist use of Rizzo um, and the traditional customer base of Rizzo is churches, for example, which a lot of people don't know, or schools, you know, just to print a single color image. Um, uh, you know, and, and they just happen to be these amazing, in incredibly designed machines um, for which Rizzo uh, offers hundred, almost nearly a hundred beautiful pigment-rich spot colors, many of which are very impractical for the kinds of uses that a traditional Rezo um, printer would use them for. There's no reason to print a menu in uh, melon or mist, like a very barely visible kind of gray color or metallic gold. So these are some examples of work made by some of our former artists and residents. Um, you can see a range of examples of what, what Rezo has been used for. You know, just a, just a few examples, whether it's smaller editions, um, zines, or sort of more sculptural works. Like this is uh, an installation of Printed Matter by one of our artist residents, Pixie Lau. And the artist residence program is a whole separate wing of the lab. Um, now a little bit about the lab. We, as I said, uh, the chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program, Nathan Fox, reached out to me and pulled me in way back in 2015 to um, kind of collaborate with him on what would become the Rezo Lab. And so we sort of hit the ground running um, in the fall of 2015, started out with just two classes, just one employee um, who happened to be me. I was the co-founder, I was a technician, I was the only faculty member. Um, and we, you know, we didn't know if it was gonna work um, to offer these classes to train people and make this medium available to the broader NYC community in addition to students at SVA. So, you know, you should all know if you're here that these classes are all open to you um, in addition to an uh, matriculated SVA 
students. We didn't add um, four credit classes until the following year after we had already sort of established ourselves with our continuing education classes. And the fact that our space is open to the public um, and the fact that, you know, we, in addition to part of our philosophy is um, offering these classes where we train students at a very high level to use these machines so that they can quickly create images um, that approach the, the level of quality and sort of precision and, and beauty that they've seen um, in the work of artists that are using Rezo that, you know, are making work that's getting out there. Um, we require a full semester class. We sort of have very high expectations because our students are running these machines on their own. They handle the drums, they come in, they can book print time outside of class, and the printing is unlimited. Everyone pays one flat uh, lab access fee. Um, the more you use it, you know, you don't actually pay anymore. You know, that it's sort of like a gym membership. So it's very democratic, it's very accessible. And we really wanted to um, help prospective students have the same experience that people like, you know, myself and, and Ren McDonald and, and Andrew, uh, who are instructors who are, you'll, you'll hear from tonight, the experience that they had, that we all had, which is, you know, we sort of figured things out, bringing, bringing over skills from printmaking and other print mediums. Um, so that, that sort of mix of uh, very high expectations, um, discipline, and um, sort of giving you all the tools, empowering you with all these different ways to make images, um, I think, combined with the total freedom of being able to book time during open lab access and being able to come in and just sort of print and figure things out and experiment, is what makes our space special. Um, at the end of each semester, we have an event called the Print Slam, where anyone who has had access to the Rezo Lab can um, sell their work. Uh, and we sort of collect uh, whatever they want to sell. It just has to have been Rezo printed in the past semester at the lab. Um, and we sort of you know, take, take uh, charge of all the logistics, the you know, uh, keeping track of sales, um, the display, um, exhibiting the work, selling it, tallying everything up so that um, those students can get a chance to just sort of show up at a show where their, their work is on display and their work is being sold. And for many of them, it's a, it's a way to sort of top off a full semester class where you're working towards this goal where you make uh, an addition and you're presenting to the public, you invite people, they come and, you know, people are looking at your work and buying it on the spot. And it's, it's a really sort of, for a lot of people, it's the first time, it's their first time sort of participating in this kind of event. Um, so the fact that we are open to the public, we offer this resource has led to us having a presence sort of beyond the SVA community, beyond the SVA environment in itself. For example, here's, here's a little feature that um, was published in uh, Design 360 Degrees, which is a design magazine based in Guangzhou, China. Um, and they did a feature on, you know, four Rezo presses. We're the only one that happened to be on this side of the planet. The other three were in China, Taiwan, and uh, Japan. Um, and, um, uh, and yeah, there's awareness of our space, I think partly because we're, we, we really try to um, be generous and sort of be very accessible and, and, uh, and empower artists and, and sort of connect people from many different fields, photography, illustration, um, painting, graphic design, uh, even but we're increasingly getting people that are working more in, in writing and poetry and the theater who are taking classes and finding ways to make use of, of our medium. So if you if you want to hear, find out more about the Rezo Lab, you can check out our website, um, which we recently redesigned a couple of years ago. We've got a gallery of prints where you can see work that's been created at the lab using the same skills that you will learn um, if you take a class with us. And yeah, I uh, thank you all um, for being here tonight. So um, to start off our evening, um, our first presenter is Andrew Alexander, who's going to talk about his course, Resograph Printing for Drawing and Painting. Andrew Alexander is a cartoonist and publisher who has self-published comics for over a decade. He graduated from SVA with his bachelor's in cartooning and master's in illustration and has been a lab technician at the Rezo Lab for the past five years, actually. He uh, just graduated to, um, he, you know, he was, I should say, I should correct this, I didn't update this. Um, Andrew, uh, Andrew's now, um, you know, he left the Rezo Lab, but he's still teaching with us. He's still part of the Rezo Lab family. Um, but, you know, we brought, we brought in a couple other people um, to help run the lab as technicians. Um, 
During his time as an undergraduate, he formed Weekly Comics, a Brooklyn-based experimental comics collective that led him to begin his risograph practice. In late 2021, he formed Cram Books, a risograph-focused publisher whose mantra dedicated to funny, sad, honest books acts as a mission statement for his personal work as well. Cram has published five books to date and appeared at over a dozen comics festivals over the last year. And probably at this point, it's like two dozen. Um, yeah, it's much more than that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably you probably did a dozen shows in the last couple months alone. So um, Andrew has worked as a printmaker for Tommy Hilfiger, Oliver Jeffers, David Sandlin, and has had comics in E Flux and Bubbles. And, um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew if you want to um pick it up yeah of course thank you so much pan here let me get my powerpoint up you does that look okay okay start at the top yep it's good okay there we go um hi my name is andrew alexander um uh, like pan said i've been a lab technician at the rizzo lab for i guess six years up until may um and then now i'm teaching a class called risograph printing for drawing and painting um the class is a uh, it's a 10-week course that um, will go over how to print on the risograph all the way to uh, how to make your work on the risograph. Uh, the idea of the course is uh, to view the risograph as a lens to look at how you're making your pre-existing practice can be viewed through. Um, so uh, drawing is a universal visual language in this course. Uh, students create art using risograph printing by ways of hand drawing images to create a new expansive possibility for their work. Both new and old work would be used extensively to explore palettes, textures, and the capability of the risograph process. Uh, experimentation with a variety of tools and techniques to develop a language of mark making will be encouraged. Students will use the risograph printing process to make new work and reproduce previously created projects. New practice will emerge from the discoveries that occur in this process. In class experimentation, discussion, assignment, critiques will accumulate in a handmade zine project. Um, basically, everyone has an art practice and everyone's gonna come and bring their art practice and individually we'll figure out what the, each person wants to do with our time in the class. Um, so the class is broken up into two halves. The first half will be all five weeks dedicated to learning the risograph, learning techniques like spot coloring and posterization and CMYK so that we have a, a firm understanding of how the machine works so that the next five Class five weeks will be spent um, as a way to experiment and to make a book, uh, to make a complete finished idea. Um, and I'm going to show examples of work that I've made. Uh, I've been a printmaker for about a decade, and I've used the risograph for about eight years now. Um, and there's been varying degrees of good work and bad work, and the risograph, you know, is super interesting in what it can do and what it is good at. Uh, this is a book I made called the Manmaker Codex. It is a, a scrolling paper book that is about eight feet long. And it, it's about an artist's struggle to make good art. Um, and the idea of it was to reference the Mayan codexes that were made, you know, thousands of years ago that were paper books of people walking to go get fruit and uh, you know, very simple storytelling. Um, but the risograph is uh, endlessly, there's endless possibilities with, with risograph printing and uh, you can print paintings, you can do, the one on the left is a Photoshop of me trying to make the muddiest, ugliest colors possible and still I think it looks pretty good. And the one on the right is my friend Ray's paintings that he did. Um, uh, but there's such a wide range. Um, I run this anthology called Cram Comics, and this is the cover for Cram number two. And inside, it's all different artists doing different styles of work. And uh, I think working on this, my personally has shown me that there's many different ways to get to an end result, and each end result for each person is different. So the course is really focused on what each artist wants to get from their work, whether it's you know, getting really good at just spot coloring or getting really intricate, detailed, full color CMYK stuff or making really complicated accordion books. Um, every artist will have something different in mind when they come to the class. Um, uh, I, I'm also, I graduated from the illustration as visual essay program at SVA. And so there's a big drawing focus. And one of our main 
assignments is this CMYK drawing assignment um, where you will be drawing a still life. And the idea is that you will be drawing each of the channels of the drawing so that when they all match up, it'll become a full color image. So um, that's kind of, those are kind of the experiments that we do that will tie drawing and uh, drawing into the way we think about printmaking and how you view the risograph. Um, yeah, um, and that's my class, drawing and, drawing and printing. Oh, I have a goals page. Uh, for the goals, I want everyone to come away from the class with a core understanding of the risograph process, learn how to see it as a tool for ex the creative experimentation. Uh, a zine, uh, a final project containing an experiment, your experiments, ideas, and your art you can sh share, and your artwork that you can share with others. Uh, and hopefully the desire to keep making risograph work and participate in our wonderful community because the risograph community is, is really wonderful and the community we make at the Rizzo Lab is is really great. People come back year after year and it's really great to see people's work develop in the space. Um, yeah, so that's my class, risograph printing for drawing and painting. Um, it's at Fridays at, at 6 to 9.30 at night. So really, it's a it's not the best time slot, but I like to imagine it'll be kind of like Breakfast Club, where everyone doesn't want to be there, and it's kind of. But then by the end of it, we're all like really happy to be there. So I think I think it'll be good. Um, but yeah, uh, feel free to sign up for my class. Thank you so much, Ben, for having me. Uh, and yeah, that's all I got. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I am posting, uh, I'm posting a link to that the sign up. Uh, directly for that class if you're interested in immediately signing up for any class um and uh and yeah if you guys have any questions you can feel free to both fire them off in the chat but also know that um after everyone presents we'll have a, a quick uh q a at the end yeah um, that, you, if, you have, if you have a burning question you're you're welcome to um to ask it and actually one more thing i, I think I, I forgot to say when i was talking about the lab is that um Anyone who's taken a class at the Rizzo Lab can in future semesters pay a lab access fee to just use the space. So that's, you know, there's we have many people that continue to use it over the years. Um, and then also we'll, we'll you know, sort of cycle through all our, the different classes we offer and, and take classes with each of us because um, we each have a different style and different approach. So, um, yes. all right. So next up, we have a new instructor, um, a veteran instructor at the School of Visual Arts but an instructor who is um, teaching a class with the visual narrative program, um, programs, continuing education offerings for the first time. So Kat Llewellyn, I hope I got your name right. Um, my name is Panayoti, so I understand you know, the mango of the names. Kat Llewellyn began her career in comic books as a colorist, then writer and senior, and senior editor. She learned CGI as a visiting artist at the Beck, uh, Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Illinois. After that, she worked as a 3D artist, heading up the CGI department at an NYC post house. In 2000, she went independent and has been working as a creative director, VFX artist, 2D, 3D stop motion animator, and compositor. Most recently, she's been working for Sesame Workshop and the World Science Festival. Past clients include HBO, Scholastic Books, AE Networks, Frangelico, Victoria's Secret, ABC, Disney, and hundreds of others. Um, and Kat, and actually I forgot to share. Um, that's your... okay. That's really, that's oh. okay, dude. No, don't, don't. Yeah. No, no, no. So everyone can see me. It's fine. Yeah. Go ahead if you want to take it away. It's, okay. It's okay. Uh, yeah, like um, I'm here with all these printmakers and comics people, and it's really fun uh, for me to be back in this world. I've been so far away from comics, and just to hear you talk about the Rezo. Um, when I first started painting comics, I know this is a little off topic, but I used watercolors. And then they went to this machine printing system where I had to literally draw the percentage of CMYK out from every single color and blend. So it's really exciting to see that you have that little tiny machine there for printing CMYK. It's awesome. Okay, everyone. So um, uh, as Pan said, uh, I'm teaching a, a class called Digital Storytelling. I'm going to share my screen. Um, 
and we will look first. It looks like this. It should be listed in advertising, animation, visual narrative, and a bunch of other places. Um, I'm a bit of a standout here in that this course is all about um, digital storytelling. So it's the ability to tell stories um, online and in various different formats. So there are many different ways to tell stories and stories today just aren't just narrative. If you think about it, uh, you know, a joke, a guy walks into a bar, there you go, that's a story. Um, a sentence can be a story, a commercial can be a story. A lady has, um, you know, arthritis, she takes a pill, she can go and enjoy time with her family. All of these things are stories. And with all this mixed media now, there are um, a variety of different ways to tell your stories. Um, there's individual movies, there are websites, there are comic books, there are apps, there are games. And I wanted to just briefly show you a little bit of my work and to also show you um, the syllabus so that we have a sort of a clear understanding of what we're looking at here. Um, I'm not gonna go through and play all these videos, but I should be able Pit to in the range of Mars is about half that of Mercury's some of the work I've done. Moon a little bit bigger. So this, for example, is a graphic piece about the solar system. And this was for the World Science Festival. And it is part of um, an online video. So my part in this is to do these sort of pseudo scientific visualizations that are inserted into this video. The World Science Festival also does live performance um, panel discussions, and my work will be featured on the back screen um, behind them during their talks. Um, that's one, the World Science Foundation. This is another example. This was for the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and again, it was just sort of a, a demo insert into a larger panel discussion that sort of demos how um, telescopes work. Let me come back to, I've also done a lot of storybooks. Um, these are so it's sort of a reading aid. You've got a narrator. They hold the jungle dance where every single animal turns up to skip and prance. But in the end, it's just a video. Um, but it does tell a story. In fact, it's a, a duplicate of a printed book um, that we animated for Scholastic, one of several. Um, this is, again, a standalone movie. It was an explainer video. For this line of VIPs, a finest of a client who Do wants to sell a system of subscription for going no, clubbing. Only got paid for um, although this is a standalone sort of informational video, um, it was also part of his pitch presentation for investors. This little guy um, is very old. Of me. Got on the mic. I came across. Jabba Troy said so it was a sort of a standalone time. video that I created, but it was a game. Um, in the early days of webtoons and web games, um, you could upload your face, a, an image of your face, and you would become this character in this animation who makes it to Nashville star competition TV show. Um, and once you uploaded your face, um, the software that was created for this game automatically did the lip sync for it. This piece um, that I animated. When we returned, he was practically unconscious. And when we got him into the tent, quite comatose. Sort of a sad little piece, but it was um, for the American Museum of Natural History. And it was part of a kiosk. So as you walked through the exhibit, you could stop and play these animations through the kiosk. So there were live action and, well, not live action. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Um, but you can see the idea. Forgot. So there's a kiosk that gave information that also included various animations that I did. This was um, one of hundreds of pieces, I believe, for A&E um, that worked on all these pieces of history. 
can enjoy many of these spots thanks to one presidential camping trip. History explains national parks. By the turn of the 20th century, logging and mining had begun to strip away at America's scenery, but California's pristine Yosemite Valley was still largely untouched. Conservationist John M So using a combination of illustrations and archival photographs, I was able to cut them out and splice them together and do this animation um, that sort of told the- Asking for a tour of Yosemite during three days in the wilderness of Yosemite National Park. Uh, I did another one. This one was on. And filed Bill way Mar. back in 1941 by a Hollywood actress. History explains. And her contribution to World War II. Just another one of those. If you want to see more of my work, you can find it on Vimeo.com slash Catlin, K-A-T-L-L-Y-N. And you'll see the wide <laughs> variety of the stuff I have done there. Next, I want to just bring up um, some of the work that is being done out there. And to remind you, it's not all just um, um, comic books or narratives or editorial stuff. Um, but this company is a company I've done a lot of work for. It's called Glow. And they're a marketing company. And they do cross-platform marketing. And they do it with storytelling. So they will be posting to YouTube. They will create be creating interactive pieces. They'll be going to TikTok, Pinterest, all of that kind of stuff. And they're developing pieces um, that work individually for each of those sites um, that address the needs of the client and the campaign that they've developed. That's We Are Glow. Um, lastly, here are some phenomenal um, various types of online storytelling. Um, this is certainly an award-winning graphic novel, but it's all interactive. And as you can see, as you scroll down, animations play, audio plays, illustrations play, um, and it's just a gorgeous piece. There is some text, as you can see, um, but the imagery and the animations really help to tell the story. There are even, even offshoots that give you more information, sort of a little sub story and the history of the characters involved because it's based on a true story. After that, it guides you back to the main narrative. I love that piece. This is an augmented reality, so virtual reality. Another new way to tell stories. This type of story um, is text-based. And although you can click on things, um, the story changes based on what you click on. So it's got multiple endings. It's got branching storylines. And again, as you click on things, um, different text comes up, different images may come up. Um, and it's a branching storyline story. This one is awesome. I'm going to show you the way it comes up. I know it wastes a little time that way, but it's really beautiful. It's a fully interactive story about one bear um, that was tagged and what happened to that bear. And I say that it's interactive because <clears throat> you are able to scroll around. And as you turn your cursor, you see different parts of uh, the park in which the bear is um, located. Some of it you don't have a chance to dry, some of you do. So here's a little an inserted movie into this piece. You can watch the full movie or you can click it close. Once you click it close, it loads this little map and you can follow the bear in real time. You can also drive around and see what's going on in the park. Banff National Park in the heart of the Canadian Rockies bears and humans here live closer together than any other place on earth that explains the radio caller constantly beeping my location to some ranger playing god 
Well, that's there are 15 cool. remote sensing cameras in my home range. This story is a story without pictures, or I'm sorry, without text at all. Um, so you click your arrows left and right to move. And there are a bunch of these out there now. There's sound, but there's no text. So textless stories. This one utilizes um, a tool that has a map that's generated with it. And as you scroll, you get different parts of the map. Um, there's a tool out there that gives you an interactive map that you can um, move around on, just kind of like that bear thing. And as you can see, there are inserted pictures here that help tell the story. Again, here's another scrolling one about World War II. It's got inserted video. As you scroll, your cursor, it, more information comes up and the information changes. Very sexy. These are also being done as apps. This is an interactive piece about the EU budget. And it's just somewhat interactive, but boy, it's a lot more exciting than looking at an annual report, right? So again, it's informational, but it's interactive and it gives you the information you need um, in a very uh, designy, sexy way. Um, this is also about a boat and it tells the story of these, these um, refugees who get on these boats and they try to make it to the Canary Islands, um, but they don't quite make it. And in fact, they end up all the way on the other side of the world. So you can see as we scroll, it activates the animation. You've got charts and graphs, videos, images. Okay, that's it for that. And a quick look at um, what we're gonna do in the class. So there's the description again. We're going to start out the first week talking about what constitutes a story, whether it's in, from an ad or a social media post um, to a full narrative, um, a digital book, um, a kid's book, um, journalistic stuff, branding stuff. We're going to talk about all of it. We're going to look at the various formats. We're going to look at the best practices um, for creating digital files. We're going to look at core digital files, JPEGs, PNGs, GIFs, and we're going to be playing with Adobe Express, which is a really cool tool out now. It's free to everybody. It works online, so you don't download the software. And it's, it's essentially um, a quick and easy way to create social media posts, but you can create websites, um, including some of the similar ones like what I showed you, scrolling ones. Then we're going to get more into the uh, nitty gritty of digital storytelling, um, how it differs from just writing a story or writing a film script. We'll be looking at scripts, but we'll also be covering semiotics. And that means uh, the use of imagery, uh, illustration, uh, video, audio, narration to help tell a story. So essentially symbolism. Um, we're going to be looking at keynote in the second week. Um, as a way of telling our stories. There's two ways to approach this class. I'm hoping you guys don't show up with your opus, um, but um, you can start out this class with a, an idea, a concrete idea in mind and use each week to create that story. You can also use each week as an exercise. I will be giving exercises every week um, that will lead you to a final story, but you can also just take each week as an individual exercise um, and learn the concepts that way and apply them later on. In the third week, we're gonna be looking at writing again um, and how to do pre-production. So creating an outline. Um, we'll look at outline scripts for films. We'll look at um, storyboards uh, for advertising. We'll look at visual boards. We'll look at flow charts, um, wireframes. Um, we'll be looking at story arcs and timing and how to plot out your stories. 
Um, then we're going to be looking at an online software called Genially. Um, that is, uh, when I say an online software, you don't download it. It doesn't exist on your desktop, but you use it through the website. And we'll look at how to create a timeline story with that. Genie, Genially is really nice because it has a lot of interactive capabilities to it. The following week, we'll be looking at more examples and interactivity specifically, how and when to use it, when not to use it. A lot of this stuff can be overdone. If it's not really helping to tell the story, then it becomes a distraction. So we'll talk about all that stuff. And we'll be looking at all of the other or many of the other online story creators. A lot of them have different payment plans. There's a free version to all of these, um, but they have limitations. Um, you can still use them, learn the software, see what it can do. Um, but then generally they have upscale pricing. Um, some of these allow you to export uh, websites um, of their own, but some of them require their built-in engine and must be housed on their site. So some of them have limitations for the amount or the size, um, you know, just like you have with the cloud, a limitation, a storage limitation. Some of them have added features that get turned on with pricing. So we'll look at all of those and we will definitely get down into one of those um, to see what they are capable of. Some of the ones that I showed you earlier may have come out of um, products like these, but they also may have been individually programmed by programmers. And we'll also talk about the cost of and complications of that. Then we're gonna look at design and how design elements help tell a story, color theory, typography, logos and icons, composition, and again, timing and flow. Um, the, the really the new kid on the block in terms of digital storytelling. Uh, in week six, we're gonna look at filmmaking basics of video specs, uh, frame rates, compression, that kind of thing. Uh, we'll be looking at the five C's of filmmaking, uh, composition, continuity, that kind of thing. We'll be looking at scripts and animatics and what an animatic means. A lot of the stories that you may be telling may have a VO in them, a voiceover animation in them, and that would require an animatic. Essentially, you're going to record your audio, and then you're going to need to um, design your program, as it were, um, to the timing of the voiceover. And we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about lighting and how to shoot a green screen. We'll talk about the art of doing interviewing for those of you that are doing documentary type work. And we'll also discuss audio recording tools. In week seven, we're going to be talking about editing and cutting, transitions, titles, audio syncing, effects, color correction, how to key that green screen that we shot in the previous week, exporting and compression, and we'll be um, looking at some software, iMovie and Adobe Premiere. I know there are a lot of tools out there and a lot of you may be working on PCs. I am not a PC person. I've never been a PC person. So unfortunately for you all, I will be using all Adobe-based products. But the concepts are all the same. Um, and once you know one, you can generally sort out where the same button is in another application. In week eight, we'll be concentrating on online comics and webtoons. Um, we will be looking at the webtoon site and the creator, Kindle Direct Publishing, I will demo how to do some character animation in 2D animation. We will also be looking at After Effects for motion graphics and camera moves like you might see in a motion comic. Finally, we're gonna look at eBooks and apps and I'm going to be looking at a project that I have done previously called the Punky Dunk. That is the thumbnail for the class. And we're gonna look at how to turn that into a book app. In the last week, we're going to review all your, and by the way, we'll be redoing weekly reviews every week and having weekly assignments. Um, finally, we're going to be looking at your final work, and we're going to talk about getting published, getting the work, the word out, and the copyright and ownership issues that you may 
encounter. And that is my class. I hope I didn't go too long. Um, but I hope you will join me and you hopefully can email me and ask me questions if you want. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Um, amazing work, and, and your class sounds sounds uh, really interesting. And um, so, for those of you you might have noticed, I've been posting links in the chat, so you can check out more of Kat's work um, on her Vimeo. There's a there's a link to the direct uh, course sign up um, Thank up you. above. So, I am going to uh, presenter um, James. Um, James Roberger has been published by Marvel, DC Vertigo, Dark Horse, Image, Fanographics, and Uncivilized Books. His graphic novels include his Eisner-nominated Post-York, The Late Child, Aaron and Ahmed, and the New York Times bestseller Seven, Seven Miles a Second with the great David Wonarovich, uh, one of my favorites from the East Village scene. Um, very iconic uh, work that that was. Um, Romberger's drawings are in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum and many other museums, in addition to the Library of Congress. He teaches at Parsons, Hunter College, and Marywood University, in addition to SVA. So if you want to go ahead and um, take it away, James. All righty. Uh, I guess I'll just, I'll start, I'll just show you a few things that I've done. And uh, like, uh, this was a, a this was a scene I saw in Tompkins Square Park. Uh, uh, our department had come to evict a bunch of homeless people living in their uh, tents and they caught on fire. It was this whole uh, confrontation that ended up being the, you know, it was, it was done for a really gallery uh, showing. It's a big pastel drawing, but it ended up, I, I, I've worked for this uh, political zine, World War III for many years and uh, I, they used it for the cover and I did a piece for the inside about, you know, the the current situation in Tompkins Square Park. This is like maybe 1991, okay. But I've always kind of straddled between a gallery thing and the uh and doing things work for print, uh doing comics. Uh and so uh as Pam pointed out, I did uh seven miles a second with David Monarovich. Uh we started it together and he passed away before I finished it. And, it, you know, I, I but the color here is done by uh, my partner, Marguerite Van Cook, and she has a, a pretty, uh, pretty insane palette. Uh, it's very strong. Um, this looks more like it's almost the styles of kind of like 70s angular panel compositions of mainstream comics, but applied to a much more personal thing. And uh, I, this is also from the same book, but here I had to deal with... Uh, like these huge blocks of text from David's uh, long monologues. Uh, when he was diagnosed with AIDS, he really would go off on these raves and I didn't want to cut any of his words. So then I, I had to find a, a way of doing a sequence within this, uh, this blast of verbiage. So like, and you see poor David, like here at the end, rotting uh, like a EC corpse. Uh, but, you know, after that, I, you know, I continue to do work that's, you know, personal, uh, like here, it's it, me being attacked by some dude out in the middle of nowhere on uh, um, St. Mark's Place, and I did my own color there. Or, uh, I, I mean, my thing with comics or graphic, never, I think it's important to to know what it is you're doing, what, what it is you're working about. So, like, it's good to do something you know very well or if you don't know it very well, to research the hell out of it and, and figure out how it works and, and, and do it properly. So like this is a more recent book I did, uh, Post York, about the ice caps melting in New York. And I just had to hypothesize what it would look like, but I drew my my son going through this uh, floating disaster of uh, you know, New York completely underwater. Of course, most of the buildings wouldn't uh, wouldn't hold up under a, a major amount of, of water. Uh, now here he gets to meet a whale. <laughs> so that's a, that's a fun uh, fun sequence in there. Um, you know, I use comics to do to do the kinds of things I want to do. Now I worked for DC and Marvel, whatever. But uh, 
I still prefer to do things that are self-generated. Now, uh, like here, re this is a more recent piece that I just did for this. It was done for a punk record, uh, like a, a comic that accompanied uh, a uh, etched di a vinyl disc. But this gives me a chance to do a, a very free layout. And uh, that's not very far from something like this, which is actually completely abstract. But the kind of markings that we're talking about here. I mean, I don't see that comics have to be about people beating each other up or romance or anything. They could be about much more abstract things. And or, you know, they can veer towards what Kat was talking about, which is, uh, you know, the kind of storytelling or, or visual narrative. Like I did this uh, skeleton of a, a female skeleton, which is in use by the uh, by the forensics department up at uh, uh, Columbia. Or th this I did, like I was taking some theater classes and in order to remember the, the timeline of Shakespeare and Elizabeth, I, I, I made it make sense visually, you know? So you can use comics. I mean, I don't think it's a big leap to use the kind of thinking you're using for comics or other kinds of visual narrative or film or animation in like things like television news. Like when something hideous happens, you have to, you know, somebody's there making that graphic that, that gives you the sense of the visual of it, you know? So, so these things are all like prime to be d dealt with in, in, in visual narrative terms. And so from my point of view, the class that I want to teach would really be very, very individualized. I have to actually talk to all of you individually. And, you know, since it's an online class, we're going to have to do, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff through email where you send me your images, of what you're working on and where I can like, really react in real time to what to what I'm seeing. And then we'll use the classes to, you know, I can I can do certain things. I can show you a lot of I can send you a lot of work to look at. And then I have other films of that are friends of mine working on things. And so we'll we'll find a happy medium to keep a, a Zoom class interesting. But uh I, I've had good results with previous students. Like here's one from Par uh from Parsons, Mona Arango, and she did her her story entirely from collages of bits she pulled off of Google of uh, images. So like any given face is like composited from several different things. And she had a really great result on that. Uh, here's somebody else that did a Guy, Guy, de, Ma, Guy, de, Ma, Guy de Maupassant story. It's beautiful, very painterly format, uh, Jerry Roy. Uh, here's somebody else adapting a John Updike story into like very small kind of micro panels and uh, this kind of uh, flip kind of New Yorker style. And then here's somebody else, uh, Emily Chang did this kind of hideous guru, guru manga, uh, of, which is just rape and mayhem. And I, I got worried about her, but she said, no, no, this isn't, this isn't autobiographical. I was like, well, thank God, you know, but then, you know, She's dealing with that particular style, and I'm all ha I'm happy to, to see her do it. There's somebody else doing a much more light style, uh, Made Cheryl, much more cartoony, much lighter, and using kind of shorthand for digital communication. Uh, here's somebody, Paul Wright from Parsons, doing a more sort of a photorealistic approach, uh, a sort of printmaking look. Like, actually, this would probably be a good story to do in. Uh, in Rizo, <laughs> I would think, but uh, you know, you'd have to separate it out. And uh, and here's another student, Lilico Schmitz, who just paints this stuff like freehand. And anyway, I, I'm very happy with everything everybody's done. I want people to kind of go into their own uh, realm to create something that they're going to be happy with. So. I mean, it's a good idea not to take, if, you, if you're if writing it yourself, great. And if it's about something serious, then really make sure you put a, a basis of knowledge behind what you're putting in the images and, and progression of the story and how things work within the story. And I'll give you some, you know, help give you some tools towards, you know, giving things authenticity. I mean, the thing is, if you can't, believe what you're drawing yourself you certainly can't communicate that to the audience so you have to you have to be pretty uh 
you have to be pretty on top of like what it is you're doing and do something that's about something. I, I'm hoping people could do something about something, unless it's abstract, in which case, you know, you're 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 floating in a whole new zone. And that's that's interesting too. I'll keep it open, but uh but I will want to work with each one one of the uh, students like very directly and uh, and find something that you're going to be happy with. So, and that I'm going to be happy with, and you're going to be happy with, and we're all happy. So that's good. All right, and that actually, I think that's about it. Uh, it is an online class, though. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have to we're going to have to be right on the call and response. So, so there we go. Okay, thanks, Pam. I appreciate it. Thank you, James. Uh, I love seeing your your work and your students work. Um, also, I posted um, so there's a link to the sign up, um, the sign up link. And then also I posted a couple of things I found quickly, like if those of you who don't know the history of the Tompkins Square Park in the 80s situation, and then also um, a focus on that classic book of David Monarovich, um, you know, for some context uh, in terms of in terms of some of uh, some of James's earlier work. Um, so uh, next up, and yeah, again, if you have any questions, you can you know you can type them in the chat, and we'll just kind of let them pile up and address them at the end, or you can save them for um, for later. Um, so I am going to quickly share my screen and get back to my hi, Joe. No worries, I have executive control, so I can just bump you off. So it's not not an issue. <laughs> Um, next up, we got Ren McDonald showing proper Rizzo form here. Um, he is an illustrator, cartoonist, and editor based in Hudson Valley, New York, not for much longer because he's going to be joining us back in the, the big city again, coming back to New York. Um, we're ready to welcome you back, Ren. He's the author of the cyberpunk epic Sparks and dystopian revenge comic Cyber Realm as well as several other self-published mini-comics, including his series Precinct X99. He edits the award-winning comics anthology X-Mag for Piao and has worked on visual development for animated shows such as The Midnight Gospel um, and others. Commercial clients include Adidas, The New York Times, Wired, Vice, and more. Um, Ren was, well, this is an older bio, but the, Ren has a number of projects that either just came out or are about to come out, um you know uh that i'm aware of and yeah if you want to go ahead and take it away ren sure thing thanks pan okay that looks good yeah okay cool so hey everybody uh like pan said my name is ren mcdonald thanks for uh tuning in with us tonight to find out more about these courses we offer at uh the risa lab and mfa vn um uh i'll i'll just try and keep all this short and sweet uh, and you can hit me with some questions at the uh, at the very end if you have any. So uh, I've been doing Risograph stuff for uh, I think like the last 10 years. I, I got my uh, first Risograph in 2013, at the end of 2013. Uh, and uh, those were really the wild west days of uh, Risograph. You know, it was, it was a lot of uh, DIY tinkering and uh, getting on uh, technician forums on the internet and uh, finding downloads of um, user guides and stuff. But uh, but uh, the medium has really boomed uh, and it's been really great to be a part of it, especially being involved at Risa Lab and seeing so many people come uh, and and grow with the medium um, and and push the boundaries of what Risa Graph can be. So uh, I've been doing uh, comics and illustration stuff uh, here in this slide. I have some of my comics work. Um, and here is some of my illustration work. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I think I'm not going to go too much into my own stuff um, because uh, the, the classes that I teach here at Risa Lab, uh, Risa, uh, Risa Lab are uh, studio based. Uh, and so I really want to focus on technique and applying that technique to your practice. So I teach two classes. The first class I want to talk about is called uh, Risa Printing and Introduction. Uh, and in this class, we aim to learn a wide range of Rizzo techniques and how to apply them to your practice, as I said. So uh, getting right into the focus of the class, uh, we do a deep dive into uh, Rizzo printing and that technique. So we talk about analog printing so 
it means off the glass, uh, old school. Uh, when I first started out the Rezo that I had, it couldn't even connect to a computer. So uh, everything that was printing on the Rezo, uh, I was drawing traditionally, scanning into the computer, uh, coloring on Photoshop, uh, printing that out on an inkjet printer, and then taking that over to the risograph, scanning that on the glass of the risograph, and then printing it out. So it's a really complicated process. But fortunately, our uh, setup at Risolab is is really great and really direct. Uh, you can just uh, you know send your print from the computer, easy peasy. Uh, but I think it's always important to uh, remember uh, that a risograph is a duplicator, is a copy machine. Um, if anyone's ever used a copy machine like a Xerox machine or something like that, then uh, you know what it's like to scan something on the glass and, and get a copy. So um, I think it's really nice to start out with that. And uh, it's, it's fun because we can really... Uh, you know, play around with like stencils and different shades of grayscale and patterns and stuff like that. Uh, and you can print different colors on top of each other and and uh, really start to get something interesting. And it's a lot of fun. Um, and I know some people also are not too uh, keen on using programs like Photoshop or something. So analog is always a great option. Uh, after that, we move into limited spot color printing. So that's just a single or two color print. Uh, we do multicolor printing, so that's going to still be spot color printing, but with, you know, uh, up to as many colors as we have. We have, uh, I believe, 15 colors in the lab right now. Um, uh, we'll, uh, after that, we'll move into Duotone, which is like a color separation process where you start with a grayscale image and you colorize it and turn it into a two-color print. Uh, we do posterization, which is kind of like a graphic, uh, again, taking a grayscale uh, image and, and colorizing it through this kind of like graphic, uh, uh, like postery looking high contrast um, uh, process. Uh, we then go into Focium YK printing, which is really great for people who do photo work or uh, who do work um, with softer edges and softer color transitions and stuff like that. Um, I do cover zine basics uh, in case, uh, you know, you do feel inclined to to create a zine in the class. Uh, it's it's not a zine class specifically, but uh, in the intro class, I really like to introduce as much as I can to you uh, and and you can just run with whatever you connect with. Um, and then I do get into community because community, like Andrew was saying, is a really big part of uh, Rezograph, especially being here in New York City, where there's so many shows, so many events, uh, so many studios, so many people working in the medium. Um, you know, it's 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 a really uh, large part. And just in terms of making zines and everything like that, you know, it's, it's always um, community driven. So I, I think that's a key part of what we do. Um, and then uh, the other focus, aside from just technique stuff, is going to be print series. So uh, using all those aforementioned techniques to create a series of prints that are uh, self-motivated by the student. So um, so uh, each week we'll have a new test print based on the technique that we're learning that week. Um, and again, the print series utilizing those techniques. The structure, it's a 10 session course. Uh, the first 60% of the class, the first six sessions are pretty rigorous and technique focused. Uh, we do have discussions uh, like critique, soft critique, uh, where uh, at the beginning of each class, I have everyone bring in the print that they did the previous week and we all discuss, uh, you know, not getting super into theory, but more so into um, technique uh, and seeing, uh, you know, discussing how each person really utilized the process uh, and if their idea uh, and their uh, goal was successful. So, um, and then the remainder of the last four sessions, the last 40% of the class uh, is focused on completing that print series that I mentioned. Uh, and by the final class, each student will bring in their print series to discuss uh, and to trade with other students in class. So uh, it's always really fun. Uh, the last class and in, in uh, each semester, I'm always blown away uh, by what everyone is able to come in with. And it's always super fun. It's like uh, Christmas or like Valentine's Day in school where everybody's just trading like a bunch of different uh, Risa prints and zines and, uh, you know, a bunch of other weird little things. Um, exciting little things uh, and everyone walks home with a pile of stuff so uh, that's always fun uh, for example this was a uh, intro to riso class that i did uh a semester before last and it was a really diverse uh 
group um, of uh, creators. So this person over here made like a zine, uh, he edited and then published a zine of his uh, friend's skate photography, uh, which was really cool. This person made like a, a accordion style book um that was like it was really long when you opened up the whole thing it was probably like 15 feet long which was pretty wild uh this person made a set of trading cards that they could put into uh cassette tapes for their band uh this person made a calendar uh for 2023 with a different uh uh riso print for each month um, this person made a little zine um, characterizing like different scenes that they had seen uh, just being around the city and stuff. And this person was a painter who was really interested in translating their paintings to Rizzo prints. So um, it's just really, really cool in the intro class uh, to see what different people come in with and uh, what however you create, uh, we can figure it out in the intro class. So, uh, you know, whether you're a photographer, designer, uh, sculptor, like I've had people do like uh, origami stuff, pop-up stuff, uh, which is really interesting and fun, or uh, illustrator, cartoonist, whatever, uh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure out how to apply the medium to your practice. So um, that's the first class that I teach, the intro class, and uh, the info is on the website. Uh, and then uh, the next class I want to talk about is a brand new class that I'm doing called uh, Illustrative Prints. Um, and in this class, I want to explore risograph techniques through illustration. So um, this class is similar to the uh, intro to riso class, uh, but instead of it being so open-ended, each technique that we go over will come along with an illustration prompt. Um, so illustration uh, traditionally is representational drawing or image making that can reinforce and visually explain an idea, right? So um, uh, typically, that's something that's commissioned uh, and intended to be like uh, mass produced in some way. Um, and that's not what we're doing here. Um, it is like this is more of like a DIY, DIY approach. And what I really want uh, to do in this class is uh, give people the space to kind of like explore their um, their their uh, illustrative practice Um and build up an illustration portfolio uh, and uh, apply the their drawings and uh, color theory, composition making, all that other stuff to Rizzo printing. So, um, so the focus, uh, like I said, it's going to be techniques just like the intro class, um, but uh, each one's going to come with an illustration prompt. So some of those prompts, uh, we're going to start out with observational drawing, followed by narrative illustration. So like an illustration based on, uh, you know, a book or a short story or something. Uh, we're going to do event posters, uh, political posters. We are going to do a mini comic assignment, but don't be afraid that I have a whole nother course that's uh, just mini comics that I'm planning on doing every other semester. Um, and this is not, uh, you know, you, you don't have to do a 20 page mini comic you just have to do an eight panel mini comic so uh the goal is to make a tiny little uh fourfold center cut zine which is where you uh cut a slit in a piece of paper and you can make a little eight page zine and each page will have uh, a different uh panel on it and I, I like to throw comics in here as well just because uh illustration and comics go hand in hand uh they're both a uh, you know visual narrative so uh that's what we're doing here and just like the intro class, uh, we are going to start out each class with uh, discussions and uh, soft critiques. Um, and uh, this is where I really want um, like the the illustration and illustrative discussion to happen. So um, I, I want to discuss what formal and conceptual factors will make uh, effective and compelling illustrations um, and, and whether what each student set out to do uh, was successful. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss their drawing, their uh, color and composition, clarity and communication, basic design and layout, uh, and again, really honing in on a strong personal voice um, and uh, pushing uh, the medium of Rizzo to uh, do what you want it to in an illustrative, uh, illustrative capacity. So uh, just like the intro class, uh, we're going to be doing new illustrative prints uh, each week. Uh, and finally, and that's going to be the first like 60% uh, of the course. And then the last 40% of the course is going to be focused on uh, students doing their own uh, self-motivated print series, uh, utilizing whichever technique they like, doing a series of whatever illustrative prints that they like, um, and uh, having everyone come in at the very last class and trade prints. So uh, that's going to be the new illustration class. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to get into the science of things, but don't worry, we're still going to have fun. Um, 
So the, the info for the illustrative prints class is also on the site. Um, and I do want to mention before I go here, uh, there is a boot camp that I was uh, slated to uh, teach uh, on September 30th and October 1st. And the boot camps are designed for students who have taken uh, online courses or who have taken a course in the past and need a refresher to just like, uh, you know, run through that uh, actual printing process one more time uh, and then for the online students to apply the theoretical knowledge into uh, physical action. Um, however, uh, I am unable to teach this one because I'm moving at the end of the month back to the city as Pan said. So uh, Aiden Fitzgerald is going to be taking over this one and he's a fantastic teacher. I can't recommend him enough. So uh, if if you have taken an online course or uh, one of our other courses in the past, absolutely recommend uh, signing up with Aiden. Um, and that's going to be it for me. Thanks, Pam. Thank you so much, uh, Ren. Um, that was that was great. And uh, and yeah, we also there's a couple of other Rezo classes that we presented on Tuesday. Um, there's space in Aiden Fitzgerald's class, um, and the, the boot camps as well as um, as Ren mentioned. So I've been posting. I posted links to Ren's site into the two classes and I'm posting a link to the Rezo Labs courses section on our website. So um, feel free to check that out if you want it. If you, you're ready to immediately commit to any of our classes or all of our classes, you know, you can take multiple classes at once if you want to, if you want to go in deep. Um, all right. So last up we have um, Bobby Wallace. Uh, who is a visual storyteller currently working as a freelance writer and producer in New York. As the host and producer of Zebro, The Moon and Ideation, Bobby shared the stage with the likes of Kumail, Kumail Nanjiani, Hannibal Burris, Joe Para, and Janine Groffalo. As a teaching artist, they lead SVA students in active role-playing games and provide insights based on learning, learnings from over two decades of live comedy experience. Bobby enjoys making comic scenes and, and customizing action figures in Queens where they live with their partner, Tally. So Bobby, if you wanna go ahead and, and take take this last presentation, um, just you know, tell us, uh, let us know um, about your, your class focused on comedy. Certainly. Florida. Thank you. All right, um, so let's see here. Can you all see an illustration of a little stand-up person there? Great, boop, boop. Okay, nice. Looks like I've got some transitions preloaded on here. Very smooth. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bobby. Uh, I have been doing uh, various kinds of uh, storytelling related work uh, throughout my career, but mostly my focus has been on producing and performing live comedy, which has informed all sorts of other work that I've done, uh, the live comedy work that Pan mentioned, as well as uh, some client work with uh, various clients like Campbell's Soup Company. I wrote a lot for uh, SpaghettiOs, and um, over the pandemic, I was writing a lot uh remotely for KitchenAid. I've produced videos with Rob Gronkowski for DraftKings. And um, again, all of this is informed by my sensibilities that I gained through experience um, DIY producing comedy in Brooklyn mostly and in Boston. Uh, and there's just so many skills that you're called upon in on the week of any given show to just learn and demonstrate the course of being a variety show producer. So I hope to share some of those experiences um, as well as some of the experiences that I've absorbed by riding shotgun with my, uh, with my peers. And as I was talking and discussing with um, Pan and some of the other presenters before the class, uh, my partner and a few uh, colleagues of mine created everything, everywhere, all at once. So I've been along sort of for the journey of that film uh, and gotten to see a lot of my 
peers who we started off making DIY content for YouTube and live comedy uh, and just seeing them grow that to and scale that up to a larger and larger level level. Uh, we have various guests come into interrupting expectations every semester uh, as Andrew and some of my other students can attest they're really super informative and often supplement areas that I cannot myself speak to directly. For example, my partner Tally comes in to do a little bit of clown and physical comedy exercises. Uh, we've had Joe Mandy uh, from The Good Place and Parks and Rec, and more recently Hacks, uh, as well as his own stand-up career, come and, and speak to the students just about the challenges of adapting live comedy, written material for live comedy, uh, into a visual narrative space. So I think that's a good segue into getting into this course uh, that we're offering both on campus and virtually. The virtual class, we have uh, 10 sessions over 12 weeks and uh, each unit, of which there are three, also come with async lectures that are over three hours each uh, that kind of supplement and give the big information dump download that I can't always uh, do in class because most of class time is committed to talking about the individual work of the students. So why are some people effortlessly hilarious while others aren't? Uh, comedy can be misconstrued as a mystical habit or you don't format, but humor, joke writing, uh, whatever you decide to call it is a mechanical and knowable set of tools with which every storyteller should arm themselves. And there's that strong word should and another strong arm, but we are in times of mediated chaos and danger. So as we're called upon as artists, especially storytellers to demonstrate comedy again and again, this course is designed uh, specifically for people who aren't really interested in starting a career in comedy, but rather to apply or at least know a little bit about comedy and how that applies to their own discipline. So we're hoping like a lot of the other classes here to call in people from sculpture, from game design, from comics, from filmmaking. And we're just gonna try to give them a crash course, a sort of Tony Hawk's pro skater, guitar hero style synthesis of what it's like to make something out of nothing in a collaborative live comedy space. So um, students will learn to break down jokes mechanically, unpack content in order to better and more consciously create comedy of their own. That becomes a theme uh, as we move throughout the semester, because we begin the class by trying to consensus define what a joke is, which is a challenge, but we mostly start by breaking down texts that we've all encountered before. Comedy as genre, sitcom stuff, 30 Rock, Curb, um, Two Broke Girls. We try to just get everything from your high key sitcom with a laugh track all the way to your sort of indie DIY envelope pushing stuff and through watching clips and counting the jokes try to decide on what a joke actually is and then in this interrogation of comedy as a genre hopefully we can begin to build uh, uh our set <laughs> so to speak uh the scary part the performance part where you're taking uh, 10 jokes or at least a list of 10 ideas that you'd like to be able to joke about and you're going to start to workshop those. Um, so like I said, we do a lot of analysis in the first unit um, and there is an async lecture to go along with this. The second unit is comedy as an art form, which I define as the, the performed act of performing written comedy on stage, uh, which can include improvisation, which can include mostly one person show. Uh, and there's also an async lecture here where we give you a brief download of, you know, 100 years of live comedy in, in three hours. Uh, and then we have a little experiment where we do live, where we perform stand-up sets for one another and we workshop those for the lion's share of the class, which can be intimidating to a lot of people and it creates a lot of fair amount of anxiety, especially in the cartoonists. But uh, we work through that and in pushing through the Phoenix Rises 
uh, and we break into the applicable form of this stuff, comedy as an element in a non-generic to comedy texts, like um, your sci-fi, like your personal narrative. And uh, so in this unit, there is a pitch deck, uh, which as working professionals, we all have to familiarize ourselves with. So that's a good refresher. And for those who don't understand it, it's a good way to define what that is. Then you pitch your idea to the class, how you'd like to adapt your set into a new visual text. We green light your project saying, hey, you know, there's only three weeks left in the semester. Maybe you want to make it smaller, or I think you could be more ambitious, so on and so forth. You're sent off into the final weeks to labor uh, and apply the learnings of the, the comedy experience to this new text. And then we'll check in every week and help you with that. Uh, so that you're leaving the class, not only with this experience of of walking through fire and performing live, which is most people's biggest fear, but also you're gonna come away with something you can hold in your hands, hopefully, and reproduce um, if it's a live thing, but you, you basically come away with a new text that you have created, a new project. And I think that's the theme of the night where all of us here are um, hoping to just create a safe environment for everybody to learn new things, and hopefully go and apply those things to the discipline that they're already working in, the format they're already working in. So um, the objectives abstractly are gonna be to identify and evaluate common structures in human writing, how jokes are written, um, also the inherent assumptions in any given joke. We're gonna understand content and how sometimes it's, it's toxic assumptions that we're preying on in order to get that uh, quick laugh create and perform pieces of written comedy with intention and clarity, and then employ those new humor writing practices in a, a text of your chosen discipline. Um, so I will sign off by saying for those of you who are briefly interested or, uh, you know, seem like you're on the fence about uh, doing this, but don't think you're particularly funny. Um, none of us are particularly funny. We can all learn mechanical uh, and, and strategic ways of creating comedy in our narratives without being born with it, so to speak, because I don't believe that anyone is. Thanks for the time. Sorry to go right up to the edge. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll talk in the comments. Thank you, Bobby. Um, uh, yeah, amazing, uh, actually, perfect timing we have we have one minute one minute to spare actually uh you know we're, we're happy to go over for for q a um but uh but you know like a lot of presenters tonight so we, we wrapped it all up right at just about 8 p.m so um if anyone has any questions um you know now's now would be a great time for you to um you know you're welcome to turn your mic on and sort of just uh pipe up um, or if you want to drop your comment in the chat, you know, we're, we're happy to address any questions about the classes, the visual narrative program in general, um, or the Rezo Lab specifically. Um, and if any of the instructors have anything they want to add, you know, that, that you didn't, you didn't get to before. Happy to, happy to hear any additional info that might be helpful for folks. Any any questions about classes? Let's see. A mini comics class. Abigail's asking about a mini comics class was mentioned. When will that be up? Um, so, so the, actually, that, go, go, go ahead, Ren. Oh, uh, so the the mini comics class I'm planning on doing every other semester uh, with the uh, illustrated prints class. So next semester the mini comics class will be up, and then the following semester, it'll go back to illustrated prints. So there, there you go. Um, and you know if you're interested in comics, I think James's class might also be. Uh, um, you know while you're waiting for that class to be listed again the, the future yeah, i was gonna of... say uh you, you could create the story for your mini comic in my class or in bobby's class or in ren's class or in andrew's class or in cat's class so there you go it takes you have to come up with the actual meat of the 
of the story, you know. And then the printing is a whole nother, you know, a whole nother kettle of fish. So. Yeah, that, that's a really important point. Um, I teach a I teach a zine class, which um, you know, people quickly realize that there's making the content for the actual book. Um, or zine, and then there's actually printing it in addition to, you know, learning how to use the the medium. Um, so, so yeah, you want to make time for both and really pace yourself because production can take a little bit longer than than you think, especially when you're doing, doing it for the first time. Um, Michael has a question about Bobby's in-person class. Um, yes, uh, Michael, all of the classes we presented tonight, including Bobby's uh, in-person and online classes, these are all open to the public. So none of you have to be enrolled as SVA students. Um, and if you are enrolled as an SVA student, you're also welcome to. We often get SVA undergrads um, enrolling in the CE classes in addition to their regular coursework. But these are these are separate. So these are open to the public. So yeah, there's no absolutely no barrier to entry in that sense uh yeah and if you have a comics crazed friend that you think would know about want to know about these classes blast this out we're gonna have a copy of this recording going out by the end of the week i think and uh and just share it to the people you think might need it Yeah, both today's, tonight's uh, info session and also Tuesday's, I'll be posting both of them after I clean, clean up the recordings a little bit um, uh, by early next week. So probably Monday or so I'll have, I'll have those up. Um, Yunjin Choi is asking, how are CE classes different from regular SVA classes? Will the students in SVA pay extra to take these classes? Yes. Uh, these are completely separate from your degree. I assume it sounds like you're an SVA student. Um, these are separate from your degree program. So these, there is a separate sort of, uh, there's a there's a credit system, which is specific to continuing education. Um, and, but that's sort of a different track than if you're in a matriculated undergraduate class. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in a Rezo class, we offer um, BFA electives that are famously very difficult to find, get a spot in. So uh, we end up having a lot of undergrads who end up taking our classes over the summer or during the school year on top of their regular coursework. Um, but yeah, but they're they're different. So they're, it's not gonna necessarily count towards um, your, your degree. Um, hope that answered your question. Um, any other questions? We're happy to answer any and all questions about all relevant topics, yeah, story. Question. I mean, yeah, I my class is separate. I could be beginner friendly and I'm also collaboration friendly. So somebody could conceivably write a hilarious freaking story in Bobby's class and come over and draw it in my class and then go print it with these, these other guys. Andrew, hi, you know what? We're, we've been friends for years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just realized. You know. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. Met in Seth Bachman's class. Who works ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, the, the whole thing's the dovetail together. It's not like, you know, it, it, you know, and something could, like, I did a story with, you know, the guy from, you know, uh, 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 uh Chuck that did, you know, you know, at whatever he printed it in Rizo, then Fanographics printed a book of it, and I I did a full color version. So it went in and then it was in hardcover. So it was a mini comic, then it was a hardcover. And God knows he could probably sell it to like a, a hideous horror anthology show or something, and it could be filmed. So I mean the whole point is, you know. A lot of film people are using comics as a reservoir for ideas. And, and and these ideas, they go through different phases. And what you can do in a comic isn't necessarily the same as what you can do in a in, in a film. And it can take on a whole new life. So, yeah. It's, it's, totally. Yeah. Uh, uh, Melissa um, had a question. Uh, for someone who's new to Rizzo and open print overall, would you recommend intro or will all the classes somewhat be beginner friendly? Yeah, all the RISO classes are definitely beginner friendly. Every class we focus on foundation first and then 
um, we, we every, every teacher kind of goes in a different direction from there and, and how to experiment on the risograph. Agreed. I think it's just like if you have something specific in mind ahead of time, uh, then the intro class might even be good because you can just get like that foundational thing and then do what you already want to do. But if you need more direction, then yeah, uh, you know, Andrew's class uh, or Aiden's class or Zing class or yeah. Yeah, and, and we have at this point uh, uh, many veteran students that have been taking, they've taken all of our classes or they've taken and they've sort of mastered the basics of Rezo. Um, and so we're, we've been, you know, potentially we'll be maybe in the future offering more advanced courses that will require a prerequisite of, of the, you know, the five kind of core classes that we offer right now. Um, question for Andrew, uh, is your, so Laura's asking if your class is only focused on hand drawing or could it also be digital? Um, um it, it, it is only focused on hand drawing within the class because we do you know we do like 10 in class drawings from like still lifes to you know drawing from memory which was like a, a jerry moriarty uh exercise and um so there's lots of different experimentation and all those drawings will be done by hand but the drawings that you want to print as your final project can be anything you want you know um it, even up for like photo based someone last semester did a felt comic they made felt felt uh push felt sculptures and then took photos of those sculptures and it became like a story based on the photos that were manipulated on photoshop printed cmyk so um really open for experimentation but the uh, in-class experiments are all hand-drawn stuff you're welcome these are great kind of general questions. Okay, here we go. Abigail, one more question. When someone takes a Rezo class, is their access to the lab limited to the certain amount of time after the class ends or will they have to pay the lab fee later on? Um, so the classes are about 10 weeks. They all end a couple weeks before the semester ends. And then you still have access until until we, we close. So I think uh, this semester where the semester ends at on December 20th, um and uh give or take a few days um we may close a little early if we have our end of semester print sale and you know just leave the last couple of days for the staff to kind of go through um the, you know kind of organize the sales and everything but basically you would have at least an additional one or two additional weeks depending on when the class ends so you have you have access for the full semester um the you know we close for the holidays, we close in December the 20th and we reopen sometime in sort of mid to late January. Um, for the for future semesters, you can then pay a lab access fee. That's a flat rate um, that will give you access to the lab like a student. Um, and then and then you can kind of book print time during our using our open lab access, uh, you know, uh, access request form online. Um, so and then a lot of a lot of students will then you know they'll 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 do that for a semester and maybe they take a class again in the future semester so that's kind of the way it works. There's a full semester access fee and a half semester access fee. Full semester is about three fifty, half semester is at two twenty five, and that covers all the materials that you would use. You just have to bring paper. That's the only thing. So yeah, we covered a lot of really solid ground. Um, any other questions about any of these classes? Any questions for about James' class or uh, Kat's class? Um, I also to, I'm going. Uh, just add real quick that we have a um, almost enough enrollment for the in person class, which uh, my interrupting expectations has uh, not had the privilege of running in person, and I've always thought. It would really benefit from that. I, I know oh, that yeah. everybody who's taken it before would agree. Um, uh, uh, the live wire environment um, is is really uh, helpful to break through some of those on stage fears. So, um, if again anybody who's teetering on the edge, sign up today. So, and I just I just dropped a link uh, in the chat to all of our visual narrative classes. So our Rezo classes, our non rezo classes, um, and you know, they're all, whether you're learning to print or whether you're taking a um, comedy class or um, 
digital storytelling class, they're the the you know they all kind of fall fall under the umbrella of the 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 classes and themes of the visual narrative MFA program and also these continuing education offerings, which is a focus on story. Okay, because that sort of like a gives a context to our experience. You know, we're constantly trying to put things into context, tell a story about, you know, who we are, where our life is going, et cetera. And, you know, um, I think that's, you know, it's it's a it's really the core of so many different creative practices. Um, so yeah, if, if no one has any more questions, I think we can sort of wrap it up. Um, last call for questions or comments from our faculty um going once going twice all right so um we will be following up with all of you in addition to those of you who you know maybe logged on late or had to log off early um and we'll be posting we'll be sending you links to the recordings of tonight's session and also um tuesday night session with also links to all of our um all the, the sign up links for these classes so you can sort of take it from there um, and thank you all so much for for showing up tonight um, virtually and sticking sticking it out for almost almost two hours um, with many presenters. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you either in person or online. Um, if you're if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out um, to me after the session. You you probably got it. You got an email with the link, so you can just respond that to uh, the pterzysvedu um and i'm just going to drop the visual narrative mfa program website in the uh in the chat if anyone is thinking about maybe going back to school for a more for kind of a bigger commitment so um thank you all so much and i hope you all have a have a wonderful rest of your um thursday night and hopefully we'll see you soon all right thanks Pam. thank you all good night you guys in the funny papers <laughs>